here at the Ingleby Gallery in Edinburgh, there's currently an exhibition dedicated to the work of the Scottish artist Ian Hamilton Finlay. For me, Finlay is one of the most fascinating artists of the 20th century, but also one of the most difficult to pin down. He was a poet, he was a classicist, he was a printmaker, he was also a gardener and a land artist. Fascinating man, fascinating art, but impossible to pigeonhole. To get a true sense of who Findlay was and what made him tick, you have to get out of the gallery. In fact, you have to escape entirely from Edinburgh. We're 25 miles away, nestled in the Pentland Hills, a thousand feet above sea level, I've come here to visit a place Ian Hamilton Finlay called Little Sparta, a converted farmhouse for 40 years, his home and studio, but also one of the most beautiful, if mysterious, gardens in Britain. Filled with Finlay's art, it's a kind of living installation. Here to show me around is Richard Ingleby, owner of the Ingleby Gallery and one of Little Sparta's trustees. So Richard, here we are at Little Sparta. Tell me about this place. When did it first come into existence? When he arrived in 1966 with Sue Finlay, his wife, there was nothing here. These were broken down farm buildings. It was a farm called Stony Path. Stony Path, it remained until the early 80s when it, the name changed to Little Sparta. He used these buildings as a kind of a gallery space, but they were an extension of the garden. He put works in there that had a, a direct narrative relationship with what was going on in the garden. This is the, the garden temple, the temple to Apollo. And if you read the inscription on it, gilded to Apollo, his music, his missiles, his muses. God of culture, God of music, but also conflict. War is everywhere you look at Little Sparta, not just because Ian Hamilton Finley was obsessed by Greek and Roman culture. The place took its name because of a long-running dispute with a local council. The council wanted to classify it as a gallery and increase its tax rate accordingly, but Finley insisted it was a temple to art. Calling the gardens Little Sparta was a joke, but not entirely. He looked for support, as you would, to the artistic establishment headquartered in Edinburgh, Scottish Arts Council and National Galleries. He didn't get the support. As you know, Edinburgh, famously the Athens of the North. He was a, living in a kingdom that was at conflict with that, so he became Sparta, Little Sparta. Thinley began as a poet, but always looked outside to art and philosophy. In the 1960s, his experiments in concrete poetry, where the layout and typography of words is as important as the words themselves, became literal. The garden is filled with word pieces sculpted in wood and stone. Sometimes they read like poems, sometimes much more like riddles or Japanese haiku. And he was striving to strip things back to the most bare essentials of all, in the way that you know, someone like Carl Andre was doing a sculpture, Ian was doing it with language. So you've got a poem here, you, Water is the poem, that's it, Water. Title, The Boat's Blueprint. Yeah. Another one here, Autumn, a single word. One orange arm of the world's oldest windmill. Ian was absolutely against there being a route around the garden, and it was a, a place to, to come to visit, to miss as much as you saw, in a sense, as you do in real life as well. But I mean, there's maybe nearly 300 works here. You're not going to go around ticking them off. Exploring Little Sparta is a wonderful, if sometimes surreal, experience. You come across statues embedded in the greenery, poems reflected in water, bird baths that look like warships. What seems to be a glade suddenly becomes the site for a sculpture on the Greek myth of Apollo and Daphne. You know, Apollo, who we've already identified as a you know, god of the garden, I mean, the first time he really fell in love, he fell in love with Daphne. She was terrified of the idea of, of being pursued by Apollo. And so she called her father, who was a river god, and, and begged him to protect her. And uh, being a good dad, he did, but he did so in a slightly lame way, if you ask me. He turned her into a tree, a laurel tree. I'm sure that wasn't quite what she had in mind. But anyway, that's so, 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 the, so, so, the, so the legend goes, according to others. In the context here, it's really about the leaves, it's really about the sunlight. Ian didn't leave here. You know, they arrived in 1966. For the best part of 40 years, this was his world. 
his work went out into major museum exhibitions and installations all around the world, Ian stayed here. He was intensely agoraphobic. So when he was having that battle with the council, he was risking everything. He might have gone to prison. Much as Ian Hamilton Finlay's work converses with other cultures and civilizations, from classical antiquity to romanticism and the world of the French Revolution, so the garden itself is engaged in a kind of war with the countryside that surrounds it, which is always trying to claim it back. Climb to the summit of the garden to where it touches the moorland beyond, and you come across something that looks like a ruin. Eleven blocks of stone inscribed with words by the French revolutionary leader Louis-Antoine Saint-Just. The text reads, the present order is the disorder of the future. Words that could be the motto of the garden itself. The way that it's placed, it's, it's sort of right on the edge of the garden and you have this kind of fantastic vista across the Pentlands in front of you and this idea of order and disorder and civilization and yeah. wilderness is continually a play here, isn't it? Underneath it all is that thing about man versus nature. So, yes, this is how it looks, but if we all go away for 50 years, this, is, this goes, this disappears, nature takes it all back. It's a kind of lingering reminder that, you know, ultimately, in the battle between man and nature, nature wins.